Okay, at 6.30, I'm calling to order the Board of Education meeting for Thursday, March 17, 2016, here at the Green County Career Center. This is cool. So, Mrs. Parker, can I have a roll call, please? Ms. Arnold? Here. Ms. Hunt? Here. Mr. Morrison? Here. Ms. Regano? Here. And Mr. Tony will be coming in shortly. He's on his way. He called. Where's the floor? Oh, oh, there it is. Where's the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda as presented with an addition under presentations and um, Dave Deskins will be speaking from the Green County Career Center. So I need a um, motion and a second to approve. So um, moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Mrs. Rucker, please call the vote. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Ms. Regano? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we go to board comments. Let's start with you, Mrs. Hunt. All right. Thank you to the Green County Career Center for having us. Thank you to the culinary students. It looks like you've got some goodies over there for us, and so thank you for doing that for us. And we're glad to be here. Look forward to hearing the speakers. Okay, Mr. Morrison. You said it all right there. Nice to, <laughs> nice to be out here. And looking forward to the meeting and tasting the uh, tasting the desserts. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Arnold. How do you say Patrick's <laughs> Yeah. You know, somebody said to me, Tay, why are you not wearing green? I said, okay, because I don't own green. It's scary, but I don't. I'm Italian, but no, there's nothing to do with it. So, welcome everybody. I know, I'm going to tell you, Derek, but okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Dave, for allowing us to come out. We look forward to this every year. Thank you for the desserts, which we are about to have. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight. We're excited that everybody's here. Um, we have board reports tonight. We have three of them, and we're going to start with um, Mrs. Arnold yes. on Eola. Mm -hmm. And I will be brief. Um, I uh, just want to express the, um, the advocacy committee's um, excitement about the possibility of the letter on the charter schools that it has tonight. And um, to let you know that um, I did receive this on the paper. Um, on policy, which will allow us to start moving forward on the policy review, which I think will be happening soon. I mean, that's it. Sooner than we think. Okay. That's it? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Performing arts, that's me. Um, I attended the Ankin Middle School Choir concert. Phenomenal, as usual. We have great, talented kids. They are amazing. I mean, and there were so many of them. I mean, so many, and they had the, um, it was interesting at the end, they had the eighth grade and the sixth grade choirs combined at the end, and it was fabulous. And these kids were so excited to be up on stage performing it. And it was packed, packed, packed. And people have asked, including me, why don't they advertise these more? Well, here's the answer. I want everybody to know, it's not like they don't want us there, but unlike, the band concerts where lots of times the parents go in, they listen to their child's, like maybe their jazz band or the orchestra, then they get up and leave. These people stay all night and it was packed. There would have been no room for anybody. So other than the parents there, grandparents and friends, it was a packed house and nobody moved the entire night. So that's the reason. And the performing arts, I've got to tell you, this council is great, they're meeting. This is a wonderful group of people that, like all the other teachers in this district, love and want to do what's best for kids and parents. And right now, what they're working on is getting calendars together so that parents are not, and kids are not being drawn in this direction and that direction. And there's two major, three major events going on on one night. And so what do we choose? So that's what they're trying to work out. And you have to listen to these people. I'm just sitting there. I'm just the listener of these meetings. And, they are just so caring and want to do what's best for our kids. And our leader here, Darren Schwederman, is great getting this group together. So thank you, Darren, for that. But can't wait to say, I mean, they've got all these calendars that work with all the elementary schools and the high school and the middle school. So it's going to be a 
fabulous project once it's finished. So I want to thank them for that. And um, we're going on to Mr. Nels. Well, happy uh, St. Patty's Day to everybody. And I want to take a moment as your representative to the Beaver Creek Board for the Green County Career Center to welcome you. We're quite excited to have you here today. I think you're going to discover two things that are significant. Uh, one of them is that we've had increased enrollment, um, which is very important because this is a school of choice. Kids don't have to come here. You have to try to create an environment, a need, and meet or, or meet a need that they have, and they've done that well. And the second thing, talking about the need, is that you're going to see some new and innovative programs that are trying to meet the needs of our students for this century. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, it's a pleasure to host you at the Green County Career Center. Thank you. We're going to go jump over questions and comments from the public because there are none. But we're going on to presentations. We have two tonight. The first one is Mr. Ryan Rushing on Debate 16. Well, thank you, um, Madam President, uh, members of the board, um, Superintendent Dolphin, and those in the audience. Thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak um, this evening. My name is Ryan Rushing. I am a fourth year political science student at Rice State University. I'll be graduating um, this spring. But also, I work in the office of the president at Rice State, and I'm working on the committee for um, Debate 16, the hosting of the first presidential debate here at Rice State University. And um, I have two major themes that I'm going to go over over and over again as I give this presentation. Uh, these two things, hopefully, by the time I end, they become um, pretty evident. And the first one is. This event, this debate, is not simply a two or three hour period where folks are on stage debating each other. We are utilizing this opportunity to not make just Rice State better, but to make our community better and really to make our state better. And I'm going to get into that as I go through this presentation of this slide. And the second thing is that you may not hear this quite often, and although um, some of us may um, sometimes occasionally think this way, but think selfishly. And when I say that, is that while I'm going through this presentation, as I'm going through these slides, think about ways in which um, you see yourself being involved. You know, I've given this presentation dozens of times to not just internally to, to, uh, to classes, to student organizations, but also externally. I've gone out to other local governments, gone out to other organizations in the community. And I, as I give this presentation, it's grown. This is the great ideas that we have around this room, potentially where we can be involved. And again, utilize this opportunity to, it's not just a two or three hour period, but utilize this opportunity to make you know, the university better, but also to make this region better and uh, how we can do that. But moving forward, I always explain where we're at. We're in Raider Country. Raider Country is an 18 county region that Dr. Hopkins, David Hopkins, uh, Rice State University's president, considers the um, direct enrollment um, in terms of our involvement, in terms of our university. These 18 counties, uh, we serve on what we know as a day-to-day -day basis, and we're um, in Fairborn area, where the main campus is a Wright State in Green County, but we also have a regional campus in Salina and Mercer County, as you see up here. But the reason I put this map on this presentation is quite simply, this entire region will be directly impacted from Wright State hosting the presidential debate. And this entire region will have opportunities, not just to be involved in terms of a peripheral area, but to be directly involved in terms of how we're moving this forward to utilize this opportunity to make not just, again, our university better, but to make our region better. So debate season, um, we have kind of crafted this calendar of sorts of all the sort of election items that we consider are important in terms of us hosting the debate. And as you see on, on the uh, debate season calendar, it's not just September 26 when Wright State University is hosting the presidential debate, the first presidential debate, as I might add. Um, we're utilizing this entire calendar to have different events and different opportunities to instill civic pride in our community, but also to reach out among all of our stakeholders of how we can advance this great opportunity that we have. So it doesn't just stop on September 26, but rather it moves all the way through through Election Day, and again, how we can utilize this event to make our university better. You know, some of the, we've been told a lot of numbers in terms of the sort of impact we're going to be having in terms of hosting the presidential debate, and this is one of the numbers I think uh, we should all be proud of, is that we're being told that on the night of the debate, over 100 million people are going to turn on their TV and watch the first presidential debate. 
And the very first thing they're going to say, the moderator will say is, live, from Wright State University, this is the first professional school of Maine. You know, being you know, a student at Wright State working there, and that, that brings me pride. But it's our region. You know, I'm here to, you know, I would say, you know, Wright State is the university for Dayton, but, you know, others may disagree. But in terms of what kind of impact we will have. So how do we get here? How do we get to host a professional school of Maine? Well, this, actually, this process actually started several years ago. Uh, one of our uh, faculty members, who has since retired, um, Dr. Donna Schleyer, um, she had this idea of what if we hosted, Rice State applied to host a professional school of Maine? Well, there is a, an organization um, in Washington, D.C., a part of the federal government, called the U.S. Commission on Professional Social Debates. So if I ever refer back to the commission during this presentation, I'm referring to the U.S. Commission on Professional Social Debates. They have a formal application process in which any institution of higher education can apply to host a professional social debate. And of course, there are naysayers, those out there who say, you know, don't do it, you know, why Rice State, you know, no one's going to be paying attention to Rice State. Well, we got past the naysayers and we applied. And then we waited. And then it was announced last um, summer that we were in the top 20 of um, final, uh, final universities. And then last fall, um, Dr. Hopkins got a phone call um, from the executive director of the commission saying, congratulations, you're hosting the first presidential debate. And I keep emphasizing we're hosting the first presidential debate because we're going to set the tone in terms of all the other debates leading after that. So goals, what do we want to achieve from hosting this debate? Um, I talked about, you know, again, this is not just a two or three hour period in which camps are on stage to meet each other. We utilize this opportunity to make our campus better, but also make our region better. So our first goal, and it's sort of a lofty goal, is that we want to have every eligible voter votes. And by saying that, what we mean is that we want to have the highest sport participation rate in this region. So how are we going to achieve that? We're going to be engaging students. And not just right state students, we're going to be engaging K-12. Our sister institutions, Central State, Clark State, Ohio State, UD, UC, and making sure that we're being intentional that this opportunity, although it's being hosted at Rice State, is for everyone. We have opportunity to be involved. Our Dean of College of Education and Human Services, um, Joe Kefrell, he's going to be working with partners in our K-12 in the year, but also be working with Think TV, um, the um, PBS um, circuit here in Dayton, and working on developing model curriculums so that if any, if a school board or if a different institutions want to, you know, not necessarily teach an entire curriculum based off the day, but maybe a lesson, maybe a topic, we can, you know, work with them in terms of bringing pride within the civic value. Because we believe if we engage students early, if we give them the idea of civic participation early, then hopefully for generations to come, they'll pay that forward in terms of being involved and being so much conscious of the political process. So to give an example, um, PBS has this amazing um, sort of um, curriculum that they put together through Think TV and um, showcasing a lot of the uh, different videos and different presidencies and just the electoral process. So uh, I'd like to show this video to, um, because I think it's quite funny, but also it shows that we're trying to engage not just college students, but students of all spectrums in terms of K through 12 and community colleges and how they can get involved. the only man who made no mistakes as president because he died after 32 days on the job. So let's talk about how he got that job. Harrison was born to a prominent Virginia family in 1773. He sought fame as a military officer, fighting Indian tribes in the Northwest in the 1790s. Before long, he was the governor of Indiana Territory, and he was pretty good at negotiating confusing treaties that took a lot of land from Indians. Harrison was a national hero after beating an Indian army in 1811 at the Battle of Tippecanoe. He followed that up with a few wins during the War of 1812. Then he retired to Ohio and had a mediocre political career for 20 years. But the young Whig Party recruited General Harrison as a celebrity candidate. After seeing how well the Democrats had done with General Andrew Jackson, the notorious Log Cabin campaign of 1840 ignored politics and focused on personality. The Whigs fudged the details to making the aristocratic Harrison seem like a common man. He beat President Van Buren easily, but at age 68, he couldn't beat pneumonia. To prove he could handle the job at his age, he gave the longest inaugural speech in our history on a cold, misty March day. He caught a cold, which turned into pneumonia. In April 1841, he became the first president to die in office. <laughs> So 
that is just an example of you know how we're partnering with different community organizations because again we're utilizing this opportunity to hopefully make our community better and by engaging students at all levels from the university level all the way down to k-12 and hopefully develop model curriculums or lesson plans that we can utilize in, in all levels of, um, of education. We're going to develop a, we have a common text at the university that all first year students read. Um, that's going to be debate oriented. It's called Pivotal Tuesdays. It showcases four um, elections throughout the last 100 years. Um, one of which being the 1912 election where you had Teddy Roosevelt versus William H. Tabb versus Walter Wilson versus Eugene Jean Debs, um, which kind of I guess idols on um, this election in some respects. But we're again, you know, we're going in the community to see how they can be involved as well. University engagement. I can guarantee you this entire region will be different the weeks leading up to the debate. Now I mentioned there over 100 million people watching the debate. We're also being told um, that between three and five thousand media personnel from around the world are going to fly to Dayton, stay at you know all hotels, visit all restaurants, and cover the debate. Three to five thousand media personnel. And I'm talking about all the big shots and all the talking heads we see on TV, you know, Anson Cooper, Lester Holt, Bill O'Reilly, Morning Joe, Face the Nation. They'll be here covering the debate. But the great opportunity about that is they're going to want to know what we think. They're going to want to know about the issues that we care about. That's bringing the world to Dayton, Ohio, the world to Zena, the world to Fairborn, the world to Rice State University, to Beaver Creek, and showcasing how the issues that we care about. So one of the opportunities we'll have is we're going to put our students front and center. We're going to put our students out there so that they have these opportunities to engage in media as one of the examples I gave. And in terms of alumni engagement, we have over 100,000 alumni from Rice State University, 75,000 of which live in a rare country that Matt I showed you before. But that also means that we have you know, over 25,000 of our alums living throughout the country. We're going to be identifying top um, cities in the country that have high potential base of alumni and engaging them in hosting watch parties throughout the country to, what Dr. Hopkins would say, ignite our alumni to go out and to bring back and to participate in this process. And continuing on with our goals, greater country engagement. One of the opportunities that we're identifying is, you know, what if we actually survey 18 counties of rare country and figure out the issues that we care about? You know, we see on TV um, every night, you know, the exit polls and the issues that, you know, the media tells that we care about. But what if we're actually engaging in a community and figuring out the 18 counties that I mentioned, rare country, the issues that we care about? And what if we find that the issues we care about, whether if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, actually brings us closer together, not divide us as some may um, want us to. And then compile a visual aid of some sorts and give it to the Commission on Price Social Debates, to give it to the candidates and to say that this is actually what we care about in the Dayton region and to engage them in the process that hopefully they'll at the ask a question during their actual debate um, that brings forth you know, something that we care about here today. Um, career development. You know, I spoke about you know the heart million um, people from around the world watching the debate, the three to five thousand media personnel. But one of the things I each like to mention is as it's fairly obvious, there are four universities hosting a presidential debate. Okay? Well, if you think about it this way, between 2016 and 2020, only those four universities, only the students at those four universities, only the communities of those four universities can have a direct part in really making history. To have a direct part in being part of the presidential process and being part of this debate if we volunteer and coalesce. Because one of the major reasons why we got chosen as the base site um, is because of the community support we have, of the opportunities that you know, we brought in the community members and really showcase you know, how much we support this region. We're gonna do the same and bring this together so that if a student at any level gets involved in this debate, they're gonna put a whole new line item on their resume that only these four universities have that otherwise for the next four years no other students can really have claim to. That's impact on our students in our region. Um, Self-funding. Um, this is on a more serious note. Um, if you, you know, we'll read the paper and media. There's been different estimates, and um, you can um, read whatever one you like. Um, but hosting a big party, frankly, is it's not a uh, cheap adventure by any means. But one of the things that we're committed to at the university and that we're intentional of doing is that any um, funds goes this debate will not be from tuition dollars. 
we're committed to go out in the community and raise it through cost recovery, through our friends, through our alumni, through foundations, corporations, because we believe in this debate so much that we went out there to apply for it, so we believe it's on our hands to raise the funds to go in terms of funding it, and that not a tuition dollar goes to fund this debate, which is a important measure that not all universities take when they host the debate. And really, you know, one of the other things, going back to this um, debate season, on October 9th, Washington University in St. Louis um, will be hosting a debate. If I have my math correct, Washington University has hosted a debate five times. Five times. That means what we're finding out is that if we do it right, if we host the presidential debate so well and we show the U.S. Commission the amount of support we got to the end of the debate, we'll be able to repeat this entire process again in 2020, in 2024, and 2028, putting Wright State, putting Ohio on the map as the debate site for this region and putting the impact back on this community. Uh, we're also being told, Green County did an economic um, study, and we're being told that on this day alone, between 15 and $20 million is being pumped into the local economy on just this day alone. And that's impact, that's bringing the world to Wright State, to Fairborn, to Beaver Creek, to Green County, that otherwise wouldn't be um, there without us today. And you know, for many of us, uh, especially with the classes I speak to, um, it may be a once in a lifetime opportunity for those in the classroom, but because we are believing that we're going to be so successful hosting this debate for the region, it's not going to be once in a lifetime. We're making that it's going to be a first in a lifetime because we want to bring it back in 2020 and 2024. So volunteer opportunities, these are just some of the um, opportunities that we have identified for not just students, but for all members of the community to be involved. Um, this list is not by any means definite. Um, this list can be grown. As I mentioned, as I go out and give this presentation, I have added on to this presentation several times, and one of which was um, the Uber-like service. So, you know, one, I was talking to a class, and one of the students was like, well, you have thousands of these dignitaries, media personnel from around the world coming here. What if we somehow partner with Uber or some kind of rideshare service and giving students the opportunity? And so that got put on this. You know, my point of the matter is that if it's conceivable, if we can do it, you know, think selfishly. If we can do it, we want to make sure that we're giving you know, the community opportunities to be a part of this. Um, law enforcement, as you can see, you know, as you can imagine, everyone from the Secret Service all the way down to a local sheriff will be involved in making sure this site is secure. At Rice State, we have a crime and justice program. Here at the Career Center, um, uh, I know there's a like the program as well. We want to engage those students in terms of giving them opportunities to be involved and to have that real on-the-job um, experience um, that we appreciate. And all the way down through the different list of opportunities that we have. And then going through the day of um, September 26, um, these are again just opportunities that we have identified as possibly being a part of this debate. Again, these lists are definite. Um, as we learn more, as we hear more, we add to the list. And we're very intentional about making sure that if you have an idea, we'll listen. And then ticket information. Um, this is probably the, the, the question I get asked the most in terms of, you know, how can I go to the, the debate? Um, well, uh, what we do know is this. The U.S. Commission on Presidential Assault Base controls the ticketing process. Um, what we do know in previous years, as we understand it, is that the candidates on stage, all the candidates, and please know I, I say candidates as plural because we do not know how many candidates will be on stage. The commission sets that policy. It was only in the 1990s where you had Ross Perot on stage with Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. So I remain candidates are on stage, they'll get blocked, a lot of tickets and you can make assumptions of where they'll get their tickets to. But Wright State, we will get a block mob tickets, and we have made um, a attention and pledge that any and all tickets that we give will go to Wright State students. So that's what we're here for in terms of you know, all operations at Wright State University, and that's a commitment that not all universities made that, that we're trying to make at Wright State. And then if you'd like to be involved, um, all you have to do is email debate.volunteer at right.edu. The information they're given um, is more centric in terms of um, uh, students, uh, but anyone can be involved. We've been getting emails, again, this is not just for students, uh, for any members of the community. We've been getting emails on by a dozen, um, I see they on a daily. And we're trying to make sure that although we cannot you know, commit to having everyone in the center of the debate hall and watch the debate, we're trying to make sure we don't turn anyone away who would like to volunteer. And as volunteer opportunities arise, we want to make sure that we give all those who want to be involved an opportunity to be involved in this process. 
start on the dessert so that I can get the kids home to get started at home. Absolutely. Um, so with no further ado, Chef, thank you, Chef Benitez. Well, it's our pleasure, though, to welcome you to uh, uh, Green County Career Center. I have worked with uh, Chef Dan for many years. Uh, actually, I was, he was one of my students at one point way back then at Sinclair when I was running that program. So I'm very happy. Uh, this is the end of my first full week working with uh, the juniors and seniors here, and uh, I'm learning every day from them. So uh, we're going to have, there's a selection of cookies, uh, chocolate dip crescents, uh, chocolate covered cherry delights, some orange delight drops, some lemon cookies, uh, peanut butter and jam cookie, uh, a sand tart, and then there's a peanut butter pie and a Williamsburg orange cake that you can help yourself with. So that will make this week, so. Um, Kayla Lundy, I came here because um, I kind of just wanted a new start, something different, and um, what I plan to do after I graduate is to open up my own bakery. Kayla, who are your parents? Who's your dad? <laughs> I was just saying that. Miss Schittles. <laughs> I'm Sarah Pearson and I came here because I just wanted a new start and I knew people that came here before and they really liked it and so I see if it was good for me and it was so far and um, in the future I want to um, open up my own bakery. Sarah, who are your parents? <laughs> I'm Emma Gurman. I came here because I've been making and cooking all my life and I really enjoyed it, so I thought why not make a career out of it. Um, after high school, I'm going to go to college and then I'm going to open up my own bakery with another girl in my lab. And thank you for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate you doing this for us tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So with your we permission, take? about a 10 minute Absolutely. break. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. There's just too many options. Yep. Yeah. You're on. So thank you all very much again for coming to Chris and I hope the dessert was well received. Oh, yeah. I'm very excited to be able to provide it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about an initiative we've been working on at the Career Center. Um, and unlike Brian, I'm going to probably be mobile and move around. So if you're someone who needs the structure of me standing right here, I'm going to probably drive you crazy tonight. Um, we have been working on it, and as Mr. Mel shared with you, uh, when I arrived at the Career Center, we were down pretty substantially in enrollment. We were down about 25% student enrollment over a two-year period of time. Uh, that was very troubling for us, and so as a result, 
Uh, we made some pretty quick moves to enhance and increase some of our customer service, some of our outreach efforts and initiatives. Um, and I'm thrilled to say, as he shared with you, um, we've seen an increase of almost 100 students from last year to this year because of those efforts. So I'm really, really proud of our staff and the work that they've done. Um, but what it did is it caused me to step back and take a look at our career center and try to define what we're doing, try to figure out what kinds of things maybe we ought to be doing to move us uh, into the next century, uh, preparing kids in Green County, and particularly in all of our member schools to get them ready for career paths. So it caused me to take a look at what kinds of things are going on in Green County, and of course you don't have to step back long to realize that you're in the hub of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, what's really interesting about wright Pat, of course, is that it's Ohio's largest single-site employer with about 29,000 workers. It's the third largest air installation in the country, and it's the only air base within an hour's drive of four international airports and three other air installations. Uh, and so that was very intriguing to me, and I wanted to know what, what are we doing along the world of aerospace to meet needs in this region if indeed that's such a large employment opportunity for kids. So as we explored that, we determined to form a partnership to make application for a study grant to look into this and try to figure out what was going on. Um, that study grant partnership ended up being with the Beaver Creek City Schools, the Clark State University President, the Wright State University President, um, and Dr. Cassie Barlow, who works with the Wright State Research Institute and was the former base commander. As a team, we made application for a grant with the Developmental Services Agency, which used to be the Ohio Department of Development, and we were successful in receiving a $50,000 grant to do research and study the possibility of establishing an aerospace type of program in this region. Uh, and so we were thrilled then to be able to contract that out to a local organization, the Green Tree Group, located uh, in Beaver Creek, I think, Ohio. Um, so the Green Tree Group have worked with us very uh, diligently in data collection. We have spent an enormous amount of time on data collection. That's driven the project. Every decision we're making is related to the data we've collected. Um, and the reason we did that is because we want the project to be successful and we feel strongly that in order to do that we need to understand every, every variable and every obstacle that we might face. Um, so we began the initiative of trying to collect data. The Green Chin Group um, started taking a pretty huge look and a pretty broad spectrum um, scale. And you know what? Some of you look like you're taking notes. I wasn't planning to pass out, but I have copies of the PowerPoint if you'd like to take notes on it. Um, so, Initiative for us is we want an opportunity to provide kids with exposure to aerospace careers. Um, we want to do it in a way that it prepares them for the job market and the job needs. And in order for us to know that, we had to figure out what are the job market needs. Originally, this initiative was focused solely on aerospace. But by about the second or third month of the data collection, the Green Tree Group came back to us and said, hey, we think you don't want to narrow your focus too closely, only focusing on aerospace. In fact, what we've uncovered with our data collection is that there's an incredibly large aerospace manufacturing component in our region that is starving for employment right now. Uh, and they also identified that, of course, in our region, um, IT and technology is a pretty big component of our, um, of our uh, economic condition here in the, in the region as well. So here are the places they went to collect data. These are the places where they went. They've interviewed people. They brought focus teams of business and industry together because my charge to them was, we're not interested in a project just so you can say we did it. We want you to tell us if this doesn't make sense for this region, we want you to stop it right now. If it does make sense for this region, then we want to know what steps and directions make the most sense for us to move it forward. In order to do that, I need to know the real market needs and the real job needs. Now, when we first pulled data down on this and looked at it, it was really interesting. We found two studies that existed. One was a 2012 study to support the base. The other was a study by Clark State University in 2013. Combined between those two um, studies, there were a large number of jobs identified in the region around aerospace related careers. What we wanted to do was get a number and get an idea of what that might mean. And so to monetize that, we went to the Jobs Ohio and Ohio Needs Jobs websites and we took those same job classifications, took the average salary for those jobs, and applied it to the number of openings reported in these two studies coming to the region. Those numbers for us were pretty staggering, and they're what really drove us to continue forth with this effort. Because one study, the local study by Clark State, suggested that there were a little over $698 million worth of income jobs coming to this region. 
Um, we didn't, it was hard to believe it was that large, but a follow-up study by Jobs Ohio suggested that in the aerospace field in Ohio, we could expect a $540 million change over the next several years. So all of a sudden, that study didn't seem too far off to us. When we did the same thing with the data collected from the base, their numbers were even more inflated of concern to us because that predictor showed about $1.2 billion worth of jobs around aerospace IT in our region. Uh, so I needed to know the real data. I know these are projections. I know these are things people are thinking and predicting. What can we confirm? Um, and so here's what we confirmed. Um, we know that the three major areas in our region relate to aerospace and needs for aerospace. Most of those are jobs coming off of the base or companies here to support the base. And what we found on that side of our study was these are jobs that are requiring elevated degree levels. Um, these are jobs that are requiring uh, students to go on and obtain bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, doctoral degrees to fill engineering, rocket science kinds of um, programming at the base. So to us that was an important caveat um, because it told us what we needed to be looking at regionally to ready kids for careers in these areas. The second identifier for us were in the area of manufacturing. So this was the really intriguing one to us because in, in our region we have a lot of small manufacturing companies but we don't have one giant. But what happened was when our auto dealerships in the area closed, our manufacturing companies got really creative and they kind of morphed into these, uh, these companies able to adapt to multiple manufacturing needs. So for instance, on one given week, a company might be doing aerospace engineering manufacturing products and the following week they're working on car manufacturing products and the week after because of our strong um, medical institutions around they're working on manufacturing for medical equipment and medical devices so what we discovered was our companies have adapted pretty well but educationally we haven't met them yet and so one of the goals and focuses for us was how can we attach aerospace engineering manufacturing robotics to make this a project that's going to enhance the workforce in our region um, the third area we looked at was IT, uh, and what you, what you should note is between these three areas in our region of Ohio, we have about a $20 billion impact of revenue income jobs related to those three career paths in Ohio. So this is pretty big for us. Um, so what kinds of jobs were out there? So on the R&D side, on more of the college prep role uh, positions, these are the jobs that are out there. Uh, that are current predictions, and then what the percentage of change predicted for, for those career paths are. Interestingly enough, a lot of us are offering um, curriculum surrounding um, technology, but not a lot of us are doing it in the areas that have the highest job needs. So we're doing the hardware, we're doing the tech um, repair work, we're doing the gaming because kids like that component, but we're not necessarily doing what the market area is need, in need of, so one of the things we're focused on trying to do is make adjustment and adaptation so that we can provide the right supports and incorporate the right training to give kids crossover abilities in these areas. Uh, so that's a quick peek at some of the jobs along the career path side with the colleges and the universities. Um, so in the aviation world, here's what we saw. Um, these are jobs specific to Ohio that are projected to come. Uh, 650 jobs for commercial pilots aircraft mechanics and service technicians 296. So obviously those would be areas we would want to focus attention on, readying students for um, entry into those fields. So as part of an aerospace component, those would be a couple of the career paths we would be looking at providing training for. So then we jump over and we look at the manufacturing side of this. Uh, and on the manufacturing side of this, of course, again, these are sometimes jobs that we're not specifically training students for. So understand what most people equate to manufacturing in Ohio are the factory jobs that many of our parents held when we were kids and we were growing up. But today's manufacturing is a whole different beast because the majority of it involves robotics, it involves computer programming, um, and trying to get that message out to parents to understand that engineering and robotics are quickly tied into what we used to know as manufacturing trades. And trying to help them understand that is really critical for us because look at the numbers of jobs that are available in just aerospace manufacturing in the state of Ohio. <clears throat> so then we broke it down to say regionally what are we looking at. Now that's nice that you're talking about Ohio, but understand the Dayton, Cincinnati region of Ohio is one of the largest aerospace manufacturing areas in the country. 
And that too tells me this is a nice location for us to be looking at providing the right kind of curriculum and training to enhance what we're already doing as one of the best parts of the country. Um, so we looked at the regional aerospace positions around us, and again, you're going to see a lot of crossover in these things. Um, you're going to see crossover in uh, areas of the software development, the team assembly work. You're going to see um, logistics. Some of the things that kids don't always necessarily love are some of the things we've got to find more creative ways to teach them and engage them in. Uh, and how do we think we can do that? Because aerospace is fun. It's exciting to kids. Being able to fly a drone or sit at a pilot simulator or do things related to technology, you know, that's incorporating cybersecurity, those things are intriguing to students. And so we believe that not only can we fill the job market needs in our region, but we can make this something that's really exciting for our students in Green County. And that's our major focus. Uh, so we looked then at our regional advanced manufacturing position. And look, there's that word again. Right? We call it machinists. These machinists are people who are doing CNC machines, they're running computer programming, they're running robotics devices, but we've got to help parents understand that machinists are no longer assembly line workers in an auto plant. So this is a really critical move and it's going to take all of us as schools in Green County. It's going to take um, folks like the Dayton um, Regional Manufacturing Association who have decided to partner with us in this initiative, getting out the message that manufacturing today is a lot different than manufacturing that most people are aware of. So kind of the link that's interesting with this is in the aerospace world, you see it happening in manufacturing, you see it happening in advanced manufacturing, and you also see it in the automotive world. And as I mentioned, you also see it doing work, uh, making medical equipment components. Um, what we think is really interesting about this is that Date Manufacturing Association have conveyed to us very clearly we need kids to have diversity when they come into our workplace. So interestingly enough, it used to be that we wanted specialized focus. If I wanted an electrician for my company, I only wanted a superstar electrician. But as companies have had to lower costs, they've decided to reduce positions. And in doing so, they don't want just an electrician anymore. Now they're coming to us and they're saying, I need somebody who can do some electrical work, a little bit of plumbing work, and a little bit of carpentry work. So we're almost moving backwards again to meet the industry needs of what's being sought in the region around us. Uh, and that's really tricky. So what we're hearing from manufacturing is, don't just give me somebody who can stand and put widgets in a box. I want somebody who can program this machine, come over and play with this robotic equipment, handle a CNC lathe, and do different components of that. And we're calling on you as schools to get, to get our workforce ready. Uh, so that's another component of this that we're really taking a hard look at. So IT is another piece of this region. We know that there are jobs everywhere in IT here, right? We're the home of Nexus Lexus in the area. Um, we have Reynolds and Reynolds, both strong IT companies in the region. NCR, former kind of headquarter of the world here in the Dayton region. Um, so we know that technology really drives a lot of what we do. And again, what you're going to see is down here, the kinds of positions that are showing the largest number of jobs are those positions that aren't always as fun and as glamorous for a kid to want to play in. Our job is to figure out how to make that, those programs engaging for them. Uh, and so that's part of what this initiative is as well. Again, then we broke the state numbers down region. Well, what's that mean for our region per year? Um, the number of jobs that are predicted per year in those same areas in our region are pretty substantial. You know, when you talk about a thousand jobs being added to a region every year, that's pretty substantial. Um, so as we continue looking at the, uh, the goals for this, we decided as part of our study that we felt like there were kind of two pathways we need to prepare kids for. And this is a little different for the Career Center. It's our intention to continue providing the programs we provide, but it's now going to be our intention to start kind of making ourselves look and, and be a little differently for the schools that we serve in Green County. So in conversation with our leadership in Beaver Creek, um, and I am a Beaver Creek resident, by the way, um, but in conversation with, with um, the leadership in Beaver Creek, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, this could be something beneficial for some of our students who are looking at engineering level degrees or looking at more advanced learning. And this could be an opportunity or a chance for those students to get attachment to aerospace engineering and other things that maybe in our local schools we're not able to provide to the same extent. Um, and so it just really seems like there's a niche for this. The other thing we've done is partner and talk with a lot of colleges and universities. 
what we're hearing from those folks are we need more exposure in younger grades to kids in the engineering related fields because by the time they hit their junior year of college they can't get it they haven't been around it enough and they drop out of engineering programs so this we see pathway one as an opportunity to be a feeder program for our schools in the county to get kids to colleges for those advanced degrees for those jobs we know are going to be available at Wright Cat Air Force Base and their R&D support companies so that's pathway one now by the way along the way with this project our goal is going to be that kids are going to earn college credit plus credits with articulation agreements or whatever we need to with colleges in our region and or colleges that are interested in this initiative um, right now we've had interest not only from Wright State as a sign-on initial partner in Clark State but we've had outreach to us from Ohio University um, and most recently on the 24th of February we presented this initiative to a house subcommittee an aerospace and aviation house subcommittee that's chaired by representative Perales uh, and in the, in the presentation meeting, the deans of the engineering programs at the University of Cincinnati and at Ohio State University have both asked to partner with us and be a part of this initiative as well. So there's a lot of movement across the state to try to look at an initiative like this that would expose kids to careers at earlier ages, give them a chance to explore multiple engineering and aerospace kinds of opportunities, make that learning exciting, and filter kids into the college realm ready for that. The second pathway we're looking at is the pathway that the Career Center has more traditionally been pretty strong in, and that's providing direct hire students ready to enter industry and start working right out of high school. Um, and so we are trying to develop a pathway where a student can come in, explore classes in your home schools, find out what kinds of interests in engineering and or aerospace, manufacturing, robotics they may have, and then start picking pathways or career courses of study to help ready them for whatever path they, they may choose. Uh, but what we haven't done well across the country is give kids a chance to explore and learn those things. So that's what this initiative really is focused on doing. Um, interesting couple of statistics here that a lot of people are not aware of. You know, our, our hope and goal is that we're preparing kids in pathway one for that next college level ready. And what a lot of folks are not aware of is the fact that currently about 60% of the career center students from here go on to take college courses. Some of those are at two-year colleges, some of those are at four-year colleges, but there's already a really strong link between our schools and the college credit abilities because we previous to um, College Credit, credit Plus, um, we had the, help my memory, uh, the, the uh, program where students could take courses and get, or leave campus to go take courses. Post-secondary option. Post -secondary option. Um, so we had the privilege of already being able to do that. This is just another way where we intend to try to make those partnerships last so that we can connect kids to colleges, get them credits, that helps our parents. You know, we hear from parents a lot at the Career Center because our kids usually are the ones who come out of school, go right into the workforce and don't have a lot of college debt. But some of them have children who go to the Career Center and then they have children who go to a four-year college. And many times we hear those parents come back and say, so many kids now are getting a four-year college degree and they have all this college debt and they can't find a job. Um, that's in part because we're promoting a four-year college degree for everyone when we don't have a job market to match it. So last year, for instance, in the state of Ohio, roughly 60% of our jobs required a trade type of training. They're the folks fixing our cars, cutting our hair, working on our lawnmowers, um, doing all the kinds of things that are done by students and, and adults in trade. Um, 60, roughly 60% of our jobs in the state. Roughly 20% of our jobs in Ohio require a bachelor's degree. Last year in the state of Ohio, statistics suggest that close to 64% of our kids went on to a four-year college. Here's the problem that's creating for our economy. 64% of our kids are going on to compete for 20% of our jobs. And what's happening is our kids are coming out, they have college debt, they can't wait on a job and they're leaving Ohio to go elsewhere. So we've got to figure out a better way to cross this path over so that parents aren't incurring, um, along with students, the kinds of student loan costs that are, that are having such a big impact on our families. Again, our hope is this is one initiative that can assist in that. So as you see, as we take a little different breakdown in the pathway number one, this is more of a feeder pathway into the college route for those kids and for those jobs that require such. Uh, and I won't read all this here, but the same in pathway two kind of the take and the look at what kinds of things we think we can do with students on the direct hire side of the scale. 
Um, ultimately, we think that there is an important ability for this to impact adult education as well. Uh, and as you know, career centers, community college also offer that. If we're successful in getting a lab like this installed that has strong advanced robotics equipment and engineering equipment, why wouldn't we utilize it with adults? That just helps us fill the marketplace needs much quicker. Interestingly enough, last year, the uh, director of the Dayton Regional Manufacturing Association shared with us that they uh, hired students, most of the students, out of Miami Valley Career Center up in Clayton, Ohio. Um, and those students predominantly had backgrounds in engineering and manufacturing. Basically, they were working on robotics equipment. Those students last year had four to one job offers. And what the manufacturing organization in the Dayton region have told us is, we turn down jobs because we can't find enough trained workers, and we're 75% short on the numbers of workers we need for our market. Um, so if they're turning down business, they're gonna very quickly realize, hey, if I go to a different part of the country, I can find more skilled workers, I might take my business and go. And we don't want that. For Ohio's economy, this is really critical, and certainly for Ohio's kids in the way of education. Um, we don't think there's anything like this anywhere in the country. As we've looked around, we find schools that are doing great things with engineer kids. We find schools that are doing a great job with kids as airline mechanics. But we haven't found a school anywhere in the country yet where a student can come in, explore multiple areas of interest in aerospace, pick a direction, and pursue it. And so we believe that this is the right location for that, right here in Green County, uh, for many of the reasons that have already been discussed. We've got to meet the, the uh, local demand for the workforce, and we've got to be ready to deliver on it. We've got a lot of work to do. So we finished the first study. That study's conclusion is this. There is merit to this project. You should continue it forward. The next phase of this study for us is going to be working on an implementation study. How do we do that? Where should we locate it? What should the first phase of the project look like? Um, how do we survey parents to find out what interest lies for the specific jobs we're looking to try to fill? Those are the next phase components of this. Um, we're working very, very closely with legislators in Ohio. We're working very closely with Jobs Ohio. We're working very closely with Dr. Waterloo from the base experience and connection. Um, and we'll continue to push forward until we determine that this is a bad thing for students, that this is a bad thing for Ohio's economy. Um, but so far in a year and a half's time, that's not the direction we're getting a lean for. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity. We're going to continue our partnerships with this. We're going to continue exploring this. Um, and we're really grateful for uh, Dr. McLaughlin, Dr. Hayward's assistance and willingness to partner with us and agree to be partners in this endeavor. Uh, we believe Beaver Creek is a critical component of this project. And we know it's true that many of the employees at Wright Pat live in, and work in your community. Uh, and as a result, many of their children go to our schools. So this is something we feel is critical for our residents, and uh, we want to try to provide it for all of them across the county. Uh, thanks for your time. I'll be glad to entertain questions. I really am grateful for you allowing me to add to your agenda. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. <coughs> February 18th, um, 2016 was a regular meeting. February 24, 2016, special meeting. Second. Any discussion? Please call the vote. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Regano? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, I'm going to need a motion and a second to approve the February 2016 financial reports request and accept of donated items. Mrs. Brucker? Motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to bring to your attention on the February financial statement is that uh, we are in still in good shape compared to what we have had in projections where the biggest area that we're up in is the foundation program because this is you know the first year of the new formula so we'll be looking at that and they can still make adjustments to that money until the end of June for this year so you know we're going to continue to monitor that 
And then in our expenditures, we're, we're under our expenditures um, projected uh, about 945,000. So in total, we're almost 2.4 million more on the bottom line than what we had expected. So that's a good plan. Rucker, I, I had a chance to review everything carefully, and it's wonderful to see the revenues 1.4 million ahead of projections, and like you said, the expenditures almost a million under. Uh, and, and I was tickled to see the state foundation about 1.2 million dollars uh, ahead of expectations. So that's wonderful. And then the bottom line, of course, the cash balance is remarkable. So. Uh, and, and I noticed, of course, that with all your estimates, you're within about 1%, and in many cases, even a lot less than 1%. So that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. Um, yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Mr. Dono? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're on to new business. <clears throat> there are any motion a second? to approve um, employment, salary changes, leave of absences, and terminations on page 49. Oh, I'm doing it as block. Okay. Um, settlement agreement and mutual release of claims of writer Derry on page 62. Charter schools resolution on page 73. Approval of type. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> Reimbursement, page 75. Approval of Utica City Schools 2000 2018 school year calendar. So Second. Please call the vote. Oh, do you want to say? Um, discussion. I just, I just like, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'd just like to comment that uh, you know, obviously everything is, is important, but I'm tickled by uh, the right or dairy. Uh, agreement. That's what I was just going to say. Oh, yeah. Thank so, you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. You, cer you, certainly, you certainly need. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. We're both, I think, benefiting okay, from it. Sure. Yeah, that's for sure. The, yeah, that's a big one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Okay. The uh, Ryder Agreement several years ago actually was in uh, 2010. There was a miscalculation on the bidding process in the Southwestern Educational Purchasing Cooperative, the EPC, that we're part of. And during the course of time, there had been an error in their calculation on what the milk prices would be for member schools. And there are 79 member schools that are impacted by the settlement. So it took a period of time, one, to realize there was an error. Then after the error was realized, it was a period of time to figure out what we were going to do. So totally, it was over $800,000 that those member schools shared in a settlement. And our settlement at Beaver Creek is just under $19,000. And that will be going back to the free service account. So that's a nice little chunk of money back. Well, and, and the fact that the overcharge was 0. .0005 <laughs> per milk carton, that tells you how many cartons of milk are sold uh, <laughs> every single day. Yeah, but we're glad to get that money back. Yeah, yeah. Good for us. And if I may, uh, Mrs. Fergano, just keep moving on to charge. Yep, I was going to ask you to do that. Come on. Resolution. This was presented last month as a first reading for the advocacy committee to our recommendation to be approved and signed by members of the Board of Education and given back to Mrs. Rucker and myself. And we'll make sure that the legislators uh, get this information. And then approval of uh, Type 4 uh, reimbursement. Again, this is reimbursement to a parent for transporting their child as it's been deemed impractical to do so. It's $250. And this month, there's only one student that that impacts on. And then finally, approval of the people who say school 2017-2018 school calendar. During our negotiation cycle this past uh, spring and summer, it was determined that we need to have a two-year period of time to get our calendar out for our parents to make adequate plans. This uh, calendar has been worked through Mr. Schmiedemann's committee. He's looked at it. It meets the terms and condition of our uh, CPA with the BEA, and it would be our recommendation to be approved for school year 2017. Any other discussion? Okay. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Ravana? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we now have the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mrs. Ravana. I just have one item, and it was uh, discussed uh, briefly before. In, on December 10th, 2015, President Obama signed into effect the Every Student Succeeds Act, or the ESSA. And the resolution I'm presenting is a resolution that's circulating around the state of Ohio from school districts 
asking the legislatures just to listen and have those individuals, as I say, in the trenches, be involved as they look at this piece of federal legislation. Where they're in a position where they can have some voice and also choose some of the items they wish to follow. So I would like for you to consider this for passage at the April board meeting, and then once again, Mrs. Rucker and I would pass that on. But this is a piece of legislation that allows some voice from public school districts, all 610 in the state of Ohio. And I think this is really important because, I mean, we should locally have a say in this. Exactly. And I mean this is and this is important for the school districts. Say, hey, we want you, if this is what the president's saying we're allowed to do when you're considering for Ohio, we want to be part of the consider. We need to be able to tell you what we want. So this is good. Any other discussion? No, ma'am. No? Okay, not at all. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so before we go into executive session, since we're being, I mean, there's not going to be any action taken, I'm going to make the announcement because otherwise you're welcome to stay, but you know. <laughs> so um, the announcements are um, Board of Education meeting, special meeting, March 21st, 2016 at 6 p.m. in the Board Administration Building. Another Board of Education special meeting, March 22nd, 2016, 6 p.m. in the Board Administration Building. Board of Education meeting, special meeting March 23rd, 2016 at 6 p.m. in the Board Administration building. And all those are the superintendent interviews, last three finalists. And the class of 2016 graduation ceremony, May 28, 2016, 9 a.m. in the Center. And with that, um, we're going to go into executive session. I need a right, I need a motion to second right for the purpose of considering the employment of a public employee pursuant to ORC section 121.22 G1. And no action will be taken following the executive session at this meeting, and we're going in because of the superintendent search. So I need a motion to second, please. So moved. Any discussion? Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you.